This video is brought to you by World Anvil. Somebody must have made a false accusation against Joseph K, for he was arrested one morning without having done anything wrong. Believe it or not, I'm not talking about Andor here. It isn't that I've misremembered Cassian's name while trying to describe that sequence at the end of episode 7, where our protagonist is mistakenly arrested in Blackpool. Sorry, Niamos. No, this is the sentence with which the bohemian writer Franz Kafka opened his now famous novel, Der Prozess, or in English, The Trial. The scope and legacy of this work is immense, but for now, in essence, The Trial is the story of a man who gets arrested without without knowing why. The book's main character, Joseph K, simply wakes up one morning to see a number of warders at his door, arresting him. No, said the man by the window, you are not allowed to go from here. You are, after all, under arrest. So it would seem, said K, and for what reason, he then asked. It's not our job to tell you that. We soon find out that these warders don't even know themselves. The question of what he's done, of why it was wrong, of how this unknown fault led to arrest, remains unanswered. But perhaps more unnerving, this unanswerdness doesn't seem to bother Kay's captors. And it certainly doesn't impede them. He's arrested regardless. It isn't merely that this question isn't answered, it's that it doesn't matter. Kay and the reader soon stop trying to figure out the answer. Not that there is one, because it becomes clear that the authority behind this arrest isn't contingent on the breaking of some law, some code. It simply is. Real quick though, I kind of lied at the start of this video. I am, of course, talking about Andor here too. In the closing minutes of Announcement, the seventh episode of Andor's first season, Cassian Andor was arrested one day without having done anything wrong. I'm a tourist. Tourists don't run. But I'm not running. You got that right. Well, that isn't quite true. He had, by this point, broken Imperial law a great many times, and in fairly extreme ways, but he isn't arrested for any of that. They've no idea he had anything to do with Aldani. In a moment of supreme irony, he's arrested not for the massive, destructive heist he'd just pulled off, but for some mundane, unspecified, trumped up charge. You look like you're sweating. Well, it's hot. Or you've been running. Why would I be running? Because you're a part of it. Part of what? Now, because this is a different type of story to the trial, and because this happens midway through Andor's overarching narrative, not right at the start, we already have a picture of this authority's inner workings. We see that, in a roundabout way, this arrest is connected to Andor. A climate of heightened paranoia, of totalitarian clampdown, emerged in the wake of the Aldani attack, so indirectly, he did bring this on himself. But just like the clueless warders arresting Kay in a different galaxy a long, long time later, if there is a real justification for this arrest, the grunts carrying it out don't know about it. And the core of this scene is, as it was in the moment of Kay's arrest, the sheer sublime incomprehensibility of being arrested for no reason. As soon as it had been made, Andor was received as a commentary on fascism, on totalitarianism, touching on colonialism, capitalism, civil resistance, visualizing a sprawling, choking system of bureaucracy. In a lot of ways, the trial is a similar text, but that recognition wasn't so straightforward a process here. Kafka died young and obscure. He'd had a few snippets of his work published in magazines, but not much more. He'd left instructions for the rest of his output to be burned after his death, but his friend and executor Max Brod ignored these wishes, gradually editing the late Kafka's messy notes and manuscripts for posthumous release. Starting in 1925 and continuing across the next decade or so, Kafka's writings were published, beginning with The Trial. Given the climate of the Germanic world at the time, the reception and appraisal of this Jewish writer was happening more overseas than back home, and even then, plenty of early critics were just confused. Not all of them, though. Edward Sackville West, shortly after the book was translated and published, took Kafka at face value, believing him to treat of the struggle against absolute authority. True, the trial predates fascism, and the dark, murderous totalitarianism that fascism would inculcate, but it is all about authority, about twisted, dehumanizing systems, and about the fact that control and obedience are psychological, are constructed. 
Clearly, then, there's a wealth of similarity here. And if you read many Andor reviews, you probably came across the word Kafka-esque more than once. I don't think the echoes of Kafka we see in Andor are there coincidentally. And more to the point, I think paying attention to them, digging into this influence, this intertextuality, can throw into sharp relief just how exactly Andor understands its totalitarian setting, the nature of authority, and the process of rebellion. Kay had the impression he was walking into a great assembly. A crowd of the most varied people packed a medium-sized room with a gallery running round just under the ceiling, this too filled with people who could stand only in a bent posture, their heads and backs pressed against the ceiling. At the far end of the hall to which Kay was taken stood a very low and equally overcrowded platform. Listen, I was arrested ten days ago. The room next to mine was taken over by two ill-mannered warders. I was taken to a third room to face the supervisor. It wasn't easy to remain calm, but I managed it, and quite calmly I asked the supervisor why I had been arrested. And what was the answer of this supervisor, whom I still see before me? A picture of mindless arrogance? Gentlemen, in effect he gave me no answer. Perhaps he really knew nothing. He had arrested me, and that satisfied him. Reading the trial is, in many ways, an unpleasant experience. The book grows more weary, more paranoid the further into it you penetrate. It's disorienting, trying to keep track of all these infinite passages, courtrooms, offices, all stacked improbably inside a series of nondescript lofts. You get this visceral sense of claustrophobia, as Kay navigates cramped hallway after cramped hallway, as he crawls between tiny, stifling rooms. But this unpleasantness, this oppressive character is fitting, because that's what it's about. It's about control, a type of control you can't just knock down. It has no centre, it's all around, unsupported, self-sustaining. There's no solution and no escape. To begin with, despite the arrest, Kay is free to go about his business. He's not imprisoned, not yet at least, so he goes about his day. He goes back to his job at the bank, but he's told about a series of hearings, beginning on the Sunday which he must attend. Much of the novel is concerned with Kay following up on this, attending his first hearing, despite being given lacking directions. He wasn't given a time to appear, but when he does, he's scolded for being late. His case continues. This was merely the first hearing among many, as we find out. But even as months pass, even as Kay attempts to find out details, how this system works, who's in charge, how cases are decided, even as he asks lawyers, clerks, officials, chaplains, neither he nor the reader ever really get any answers. It's the same in Andor. Civil disruption, anti-imperial speech, <laughs> fleeing the scene of anti-imperial activity, attempted damage to imperial property. I'm sorry, there's something wrong. Even at the trial, the fact that Cassian didn't do the things he's charged with, the fact that those charges themselves are vague to the point of meaninglessness, all this is utterly immaterial. A beleaguered official sighs, pounding away at a typewriter almost more focused on her lunch than whichever poor sod happens to be beneath the pulpit. Charges are read, notes are scribbled down, a sentence is given, the judge calls next, and the process repeats. It's going to be repeating for a while. Cassian, or Keith Gergo as he's going by on Niamos, which spectacular name by the way, is but one of many waiting for their trial. There are throngs of confused, probably also innocent civilians doomed to a similar fate. All this looks to be happening in, well, not a courtroom. Much like the court's offices in the trial, this doesn't appear to be a purpose-built space. It looks like an impromptu setup, an ad hoc mock court. This is purposeful world building, the implication being, of course, that the stricter powers put in place following Aldani have led to an increase in arrests so rapid that even their jailers are becoming overwhelmed. The last comment Cassian gets from the judge, after again protesting the incomprehensibility of his fate, is this. But Change of guidelines. Take away. I didn't do anything. Hey! Take it up with the Emperor. Wait! <laughs> It goes without saying that Cassian cannot, in fact, take it up with the Emperor. No, the judge is simply disavowing herself of any responsibility, any agency in Cassian's sentencing. But here's the thing. Even if somehow Cassian could take it up with the Emperor, if a wormhole had opened then and there and taken Cassian to Coruscant, old Wrinkleface here wouldn't have had a clue what Cassian was on about because he didn't sentence Cassian, the judge did. 
Given the picture we'd been given in this episode and before of the ISB, of the opportunism, clashing motives, and inattentions of the Imperial elite, it's doubtful that the Space Patriot Act behind this policing crackdown was entirely the Emperor's idea. But even if it was, even if Palpatine woke up one morning determined to clamp down on the sparks of the rebellion, if he wrote that whole bill himself and personally ensured its passage, nowhere in his words, in his gestures, in his intentions would there have been anything about arresting, convicting, and imprisoning guys walking to the shop. No, inasmuch as any one person is responsible for this nonsensical arrest, the arresting officer is responsible, the judge is responsible. But that responsibility, that agency, is instinctively, reflexively displaced onto some abstract body authority. In a discussion on Kafka, bureaucracy, and totalitarianism, Mark Fisher, adopting an idea from Slavoj Žižek, himself having modified it from Lacan, refers to this as the big other, the collective fiction, the symbolic structure which can never be encountered in itself, instead we only ever confront its stand-ins. Thus, Cassian encounters the judge, and Kay encounters the warders, the court ushers, the chaplain. Fisher writes, The frustration of dealing with bureaucrats often arises because they themselves can make no decisions. Rather, they are permitted only to refer to decisions that have already always been made by the big other. Kafka was the greatest writer on bureaucracy because he saw that this structure of disavowal was inherent to bureaucracy. But what does the structure of bureaucracy have to do with totalitarianism? Well, more than you might have thought. Fisher continues, if Kafka is valuable as a commentator on totalitarianism, it is by revealing that there was a dimension of totalitarianism which cannot be understood on the model of despotic command. We see this in the trial, the way Kay's ultimate fate is decided not by any true authority, not even by the highest court, utterly inaccessible as they are, but by layers of functionaries stacked on top of one another, each guessing, each interpreting the will of authority, how the law should look, how it should be implemented. Similarly, authority in the totalitarianism of Andor, of Star Wars, isn't just created in the commands of Palpatine or of the Senate, the ISB. No, for the most part, the very existence of that authority is but an illusion, created by each bureaucrat, each officer, every time they justify their actions as deferral to regulations, every time they arrest and convict a man for doing nothing wrong. It's almost a field, a living force surrounding this galaxy, at once generated by and controlling every clerk, every stormtrooper, every official. As Fisher writes, describing simultaneously the bureaucratic labyrinths of Kafka's fiction and the semiotics of the Soviet system, no one knew what was required. Instead, individuals could only guess what particular gestures and directives meant. The court which sentences Cassian to Narkina V, a second-rate office on a far-flung planet, is guessing at meanings, directives, intent, doing so under the guise of some direct, unequivocal, authoritative mandate, when in reality, nothing of the sort exists. Taken together, what these texts show us is that the trick of totalitarianism is that structure of disavowal, the way this obscures individual agency and complicity, and the emptiness, the incomprehensibility of both these arrests, Cassians and Kays, are not, as they might at first appear, absurd non sequiturs, random glitches, the result of a massive system's occasional malfunction. These innocent arrests, and the maddening way that innocence doesn't ever come close close to mattering are the clearest window, the only real window we're given into the nature of the Empire or of Kafka's courts. They're not bugs of authoritarianism, they're features. They are THE feature. That isn't the end of the story, though. If anything, it's only the start. Because even if the Trial and Andor do understand the basic nature of authority in that same way, what the texts proceed to do with that understanding couldn't be more different. If you were innocent, then the matter is simple. Kay's eyes clouded over. This man who gave himself out to be an agent of the court was talking like an ignorant child. My innocence doesn't simplify the matter, Kay said. What matters are the many subtleties in which the court gets lost, but in the end it produces great guilt from some point where originally there was nothing at all. 
Eventually, Kay is executed, and the novel ends. And we never even find out what Kay's supposed offence was. The trial isn't a story in the way you might be more familiar with. There's no real journey, no real arcs, no meaningful agency even. Nothing Kay does has any real effect on his future. It is, first and foremost, a vision of power, of an infinite, bureaucratic underbelly to that power, the maddening unknowability of that underbelly, and the way that breaks a man, kills him well before his executioners do. Going into Andor, we know Cassian too dies at the end. We know he doesn't make it out of the Galactic Civil War alive. We've seen Rogue One. But these deaths couldn't be more dissimilar. One marks defeat, the other victory. That might sound kind of strange, how is death victory? But with Cassian, it's death for a purpose. Death that leads fairly directly to the final defeat of this vast authority, and to Cassian's posthumous vindication. In a lot of ways, it's in direct opposition to the trial, where nothing has a purpose, least of all Kay's eventual unceremonious end. Indeed, this contrast takes on new weight when you consider that Cassian begins with an outlook not unlike that of the trial, an awareness of the limitations and absurdities of this seemingly infinite bureaucracy balanced out by a fatalistic conviction that real change, real opposition, is not merely inadvisable but simply impossible. You just walk in like you belong? Takes more than that, doesn't it? What, to steal from the Empire? What do you need? A uniform, some dirty hands, and an Imperial toolkit? For those of you familiar with Kafka, we might imagine this Cassian's abuse of the system as a defendant pursuing the path of apparent acquittal, using loopholes in the system to make subjugation as comfortable as possible. By the end of Andor though, and certainly by Rogue One, Cassian goes further than Kay ever did, than the trial ever did, and opposes that subjugation. To be clear, the fact that Kay doesn't, I don't know, start a rebellion against the courts, the warders, that unknowably vast authority behind them, I'm not saying that that's a flaw in the trial, of course not. As noted above, this is simply beyond the scope of the text. So why is Andor different? How is Andor different? How does it move past that paralyzing vision of self-reinforcing, incomprehensible, totalitarian bureaucracy when in the trial the same structure of disavowal, the same event, the nonsensical arrest, is so utterly victorious? Well, let's look at what follows. In Cassian's case, the arrest does lead to imprisonment on Narkina 5. Escape looks to be impossible, and even discussing the prospect seems off the table, thanks to Kino Loy. Kino is the floor manager for the section of the prison Cassian ends up in, and while a prisoner himself, he's initially something of an antagonistic presence. To begin with, at least, Kino functions as a part of the Imperial apparatus of control, of authority. He helps maintain productivity on the factory floor, and he enforces the prison rules, even when out of range of any watchful Imperial eyes. Nobody's listening! Nobody's listening! Kino plays this servile role because he still believes the inmates have a future outside of the prison complex, that one day they will be released so long as they follow the rules. Even if, miraculously, it were possible to escape sooner, the vagrant life of an escaped convict is essentially a walking death. No, better to knuckle under, to continue to labour dutifully under the watchful eye of this massive, omniscient authority, this big other. What we see in Kino across these jailbreak episodes is the lifting of that illusion, the questioning of the big other. Kino sees that Imperial authority here exists only in the mind's eye. It's a falsehood buoyed by fatal weapons and that exceedingly hostile architecture, but all that really exists here is a building, a small number of guards, and a huge number of inmates. Everything else is smoke and mirrors. The rest of the galaxy, even the judges, the guards, most of them don't know about the inhabitants of Narkina 5, and they certainly don't care about them. Maybe there'll be some grunts tasked with trying to secure the prison, round up escapees, but after that, there'll be names on some list, and nothing more. Kino sees that once he stops upholding that control, stops being the dutiful floor manager, steps out of that structure of disavowal, that authority is gone, at least within his little corner of the facility. 
The jailbreak sequence itself contains plenty of action, daring moves, nail-biting stunts, but what makes escape possible? What really defeats Imperial authority here is Kino's realization and communication of that emptiness. Ironically, that realization was prompted by the prison's management. In sending a supposedly released convict right back into the compound, merely to a different floor, they revealed to the prisoners that they probably aren't getting out. The chance of escaping, a life on the run, looked pretty bad compared to a legitimate release, but when that release is taken off the table, when it's escape or die, life on the run starts to look pretty good. Kino sees this instantly. How many guards on each level? Never more than 12. In attempting to assert the totality of its power, the prison instead reveals its own precariousness. So Andor shows us how power works, how authority is maintained, how the empty center, the divide between bureaucrats, officials, servants of authority, and the things they're enforcing, employing, obeying, allows incomprehensible, inhumane actions to be taken without the batting of an eye. But afterward, it shows us, through Kino's journey from complicity to defiance, that this emptiness can be seen and communicated, even to those within the apparatus. The difference between the trial and Andor is that in the latter text, our protagonist isn't the only true subject. Despite some aesthetic realism, Kafka gives us a fairly one-dimensional world, one in which characters are characters, playing their parts so that Kay can bounce, pinball style, deeper and deeper into the nightmare of his case. Andor is more naturalistic, more humanistic. Kino, Nemec, Luthen, all these other people we spend time with aren't NPCs, they're other players. Their roles are not necessarily predetermined. Again, neither approach is right or wrong, they're choices. The trial is a portrait of power, of defeat, and Andor is not. Andor is a vision of optimism, of the contingency and changeability of the world, and the structures that govern it. But in making that choice, and crucially, in Kino Loy, in following up that nightmarish arrest scene, a scene which seems to follow the trial and show us the powerlessness of the subject in a system of bureaucratic, disavowed totalitarianism, with the story of another person, besides us, besides our protagonist, realizing how hollow this system and the authority it creates really is, Andor moves past Kafka's paralyzing, fatalistic vision. Somebody must have made a false accusation against Joseph Kay, for he was arrested one morning without having done anything wrong. On his way to the store, Cassian Andor was arrested for no reason. Both texts use this same surreal event to interrogate authority, and the structures by which authority maintains itself. Both texts reveal an emptiness at the center of their respective powers, a divide between the shadowy, unseen figures responsible for the edicts, the rules, the directives, and those enforcing or applying these. The divide goes unnoticed by the warders, the judges, the jailers, but it's what allows them to detain, arrest, convict with impunity, because it's never their choice. It's the rules, it's the law, it's the regulations. But while one text stops there, the other presses on and bursts forth. Andor's contention is that this divide, this emptiness, cuts both ways. Sure, it means you might get arrested for no reason. It means your life can be arbitrarily destroyed, but that destruction is arbitrary. And as it becomes more commonplace, as the abuses facilitated by this structure of disavowal reach further and further, that arbitrary quality, that emptiness reveals itself. And every now and then, that's enough, just enough, to light a spark, to snap someone out, to inspire rebellion. And maybe it isn't always that simple. Maybe, as history will attest, this isn't always enough to single-handedly overthrow a regime, but it means there's always a resistance. There's always defectors. And sometimes, sometimes it works. Sometimes Andor's vision rings true, truer than Kafka's, because despite the aliens, the lasers, the spaceships, our world is nearer to Andor than it is to the trial. It isn't centered around one man. There's billions of us, each as real as the next, each with the power to resist, and each able to resist power. 
but maybe it has to be collective. These ideas need to be communicated. The prison break wouldn't have worked without the other rooms, the other floors getting the message. But maybe that communication is the purpose of art like this. And I think it's fair to say Andor does a pretty good job. Part of that is the ideas it's working with, but part of it's the execution. The characters feel real. The world feels real. It looks real. So much care has been put into the set design, the costuming, every little detail, the disused, overcrowded court space, the dehumanizing prison, whatever else Andor is, it's a masterclass in world building. And if you're a writer, or a storyteller, or a game developer, or a dungeon master, and you want to take a leaf out of this show's book, if you want to level up your world building skills, that's where this video's sponsor, World Anvil, comes in. World Anvil is a really cool online resource with a bunch of tools to make creating and keeping track of worlds, characters, and stories easy and convenient. You can get started with professionally designed world building templates, you can integrate interactive maps, images, sounds to capture the perfect tone. You can create wiki style pages to keep track of lore, set up character profiles, you can group all of these different tools together, it's all searchable, and when you've built your world, there's a bespoke novel writing software, and it's cloud based, so you can write from any device, anywhere. And there's even a publishing platform to help you release your work. World Anvil isn't just for those looking to create worlds, either. There's a whole host of tools for those of you into role-playing games and the like to keep track of your characters, quests, timelines, and much more. Honestly, it's just the best solution out there for creatives and writers, whether you're focused on fantasy, sci-fi, or anything else. And by using my coupon code GARBAGE, you can get 40% off any yearly subscription to the platform. So go check out worldanvil.com, it's linked below, it is such a cool service service, and huge thank you to them for sponsoring this video. Also, just a big thank you to everyone who's watching. This was an idea I'd had for months, it's taken a good while to put together, and I'm really grateful to be in a position where I get to make videos like this and share them with an audience. As always, likes, shares, and Patreon pledges of any level are massively appreciated. Let me know what you thought of this one down below, and I'll see you all next time. Final shout out, as always, going to my current patrons on screen now, and especially Ryan Emily, Daniel Goldhorn, Have a Long and Weirdy Beardy.